Hi, uh, welcome to my talk. I hope you had a great lunch. Um, yeah, so my talk is how not to read a room, creating a socially awkward wearable. And I'm gonna start with a disclaimer that yes, like this is my talk. <laughs> I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes or so just talking about my necklace. So if you're not prepared for that, feel free to leave. Um, and I'm going to talk about my necklace because it's using a lot of tech to respond to people around me. Um, it's, it's loaded with tech. Uh, so here's, uh, here's how it's basically working. So I have um, a camera around my neck on this choker that's taking a picture. And this camera is attached to a Raspberry Pi down on this girdle on my waist. And the Pi is running Node.js, uh, TensorFlow.js, and an image recognition model. Um, and the machine learning model on the Pi determines how many people it sees. And then it sends that info to an Adreno. And the Adreno is attached to all these LEDs and it's controlling the lights on the necklace. And when it gets the message from the Pi, it's updating the colors and patterns of the LEDs based on preset parameters that I have um, to tell it how it should respond. If you don't know who I am, I'm Stephanie. I'm a web developer um, and I live in Berlin. I'm originally from Alabama actually, but I live in Berlin. And I'm a front-end web engineer on Microsoft To Do. Um, and I'm mainly for my day job, I'm doing React, uh, really focused on accessibility and uh, HTML and CSS. Um, yeah. And so I started making wearables a few years ago. And I started making, making lighted clothing just because I thought it was beautiful. I kind of started making them before I thought about the implications of me actually having to wear them. Um, so they're really beautiful to me, but they're also kind of a burden for me. Uh, I love them, but it's really hard for me to deal a lot with the attention that they draw. And I've tried to channel that anxiety from wearing them into fascination and cultivate like this fascination and excitement around it and um, use them in some way to confront the, my discomfort of the attention that they draw. And I wanted to show you a couple of, like, where I started from making. So I didn't start making something like this. This is quite complicated. Um, so the first project I ever made was this uh, fiber optic dress. I was going to a festival, and I thought this was just kind of thing that you did at festivals. I, I don't know. I don't get out much, so I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so I copied in an Instructables tutorial. I bought, this is a fiber optic way, a rave whip. Uh, so it's just like a, like, I think 200 strands of fiber optics attached to a flashlight, and it has preset patterns on the flashlight, and you can just click a button to change it. So I just followed it exactly. My mom sewed this dress for me, and then I sewed all the LEDs, uh, sorry, not LEDs, all the strands of fiber optics on it. Um, there was no programming, no soldering, none of that. And when I wore it for the first time, I felt extremely awkward. But I got lots of compliments, and people would just like liked interacting and had a lot of questions about it. And it gave me a bit of a self-esteem boost. And so that kind of is part of the motivation I keep going, because I don't know, people, I like compliments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just, I liked it, but I wished it could have been more alive and interactive. It was more like I just set the program um, on it and just wore it, and there was, there was no like, responsiveness to it. Um, so this is the next project I made, and I, this was the project I made last year, and I gave a, a talk about this and wore it at several conferences. I've linked to my conference talk at JSConf EU um, at that link, if you want to check it out. Um, but this, in this project, I, so by this time I had been coding for a bit longer, and I felt like I could actually try to code something on hardware and uh, actually put my skills to work in a hardware piece. Um, so I wanted to explore the reactions of people when they realized that 
the lives could be changed with the web app. So I made this, these pieces, and then I also had a web app that I built in React um, that you could go to and click colors and put, um, patterns and send it to um, my outfit. Um, so anyone on the web could change the colors and patterns. And it was a lot of coding, I had a React app, and then on the back end I was using Node.js, MQTT messaging protocol, and Adrenos. Um, and it was a ton of soldering, it was a lot of work. Um, but people really liked it, but uh, with having a web app, I was stuck having to always have my phone and have to tether Wi-Fi off of it to have the connection. And in this piece, I really purposely wanted to explore creating a temporary experience that created viewer with directly to the art piece for a brief moment, like kind of blurring the line of if I'm the artist because I made the piece or if they're the artist because they're actually changing and influencing how it looked when I wore it. Um, so it was an interesting direction to go, but it was kind of a way, uh, a, not the way I really wanted to continue exploring. I really wanted to take away the need for direct interaction by others. And I wanted the wearable to focus more on me and what I was experiencing than uh, just be influenced by other people. So the next project, this is the last project I made before this. Um, I made this speech to image necklace. Uh, I, and I used to live in Amsterdam last year. And my uh, colleague and I, we ran a stupid hackathon, and this is like the project I made for the stupid hackathon. If you don't know what a stupid hackathon is, you should like check that out or have your own because everyone just comes, it's so not serious. Everyone just comes and makes the most ridiculous uh, app they can think of, and it's just a lot of fun and low pressure situation. But anyway, I made this necklace, and um, it would show an accompanying images to what I was saying. So it doesn't have sound, but I have a caption. So I'm saying, I like turtles. And then it's showing the meme of a, a kid dressed up as a zombie that said, I like turtles. So it found that. Um, so I made this necklace. So uh, when I was speaking to someone, it would show images of what I was saying and that they would in an attempt that they would find me interesting and continue engaging conversation with me. Um, this was like just my exploration here. Um, so uh, what it is is a Raspberry Pi 3B with a touch screen attached and a microphone. And I have a Node.js server running and sending audio from what I'm saying to the Google speech recognition cloud API and then sending those keywords to, the, uh, to a Google custom search API and doing an image search and then sending that back. So it was responsive to the environment, but it still needed Wi-Fi, which um, I think of as a negative. Um, and interestingly enough, since I'm going to talk about, for the rest of the talk about machine learning in this project, I want to point out that I, I ironically didn't really realize I was using machine learning here. Um, I, until I really looked back to work on this talk, because I feel like m machine learning is a bit um, pervasive, and I used it here, and I really just thought I was using APIs, <laughs> and I was just sending a request and getting back a response. Um, but yeah, I actually have built something with machine learning before and didn't really realize it. <laughs> um, yeah, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about this necklace. And I wanted to take the things from those other projects and go in a different direction. So I wanted it to be responsive to people around me, but in a way that actually um, would decrease my, oh, sorry, that increases my discomfort until I conform to social norms. So I wanted it to be obnoxious, flashy attention getting um, when I was keeping to myself and it would only calm down and eventually turn off when I forced myself to be sociable and surround myself with other people. Um, there's no app to control this. Um, it's just using machine learning and a camera. Um, so it's, yeah, it senses how many people around me and responds accordingly to parameters I've set. And um, it may seem like I'm purposely trying to t track people with the lights, but to me I see it as less about that 
It's more about me wanting to get rid of the lights as soon as possible, and that forcing me to be sociable. <laughs> um, so, and I feel like showing you all these projects in this progression of my work is really a convincing reason, uh, all the convincing reasons that you would need to know why I made this project, but I've alleged, misled you a bit because there really was a defining moment um, earlier this year when I decided to make this. So, like I said before, I work at Microsoft and um, I started this job uh, almost a year ago. And when I started, it was my first job at like big mega tech corp. And I felt very insecure with my skills. Everyone else has CS, uh, computer science degrees. I am a non-traditional coder. I'm a career changer, later in life career changer. Um, and after I started this job, uh, folks started a machine learning study group and they were doing a big online um, MOOC course online. And everyone from the first uh, study group, everyone was learning so fast. And I was falling behind from the first study group. And I really wanted to prove, to mainly to myself, that you could learn all these concepts, but I could do it in my own style, in the own, my own way of learning. And for me, that meant I wanted to create a physical use case for machine learning that was relevant to me and my interests. And so the real reason I made this is because I couldn't keep up with a machine learning course at work. <laughs> and I wanted to prove myself to everyone and to myself. Um, so I started looking at other alternative uh, like uh, videos and ways of learning. And there was two that really helped me. So the first one is this machine learning for artists course created by uh, Gene Pogan. He uh, gives a lot of lectures, but he's a, he teaches at NYU. And this really opened to my eyes, my eyes to uh, what artists and non-traditional technologists are doing with machine learning. For example, this is using facial expressions to play Tetris. Um, and it just, there's just, watching the videos, there's just so many projects like this. And it really opened up to my eyes into how you could creatively integrate machine learning into a wearable, to this, a new wearable project. And the second learning resource that really helped me is Coding Train with Dan Schiffman. And uh, I mean, I, he, I learned, a, I watched a lot of his videos on getting started with TensorFlow.js. And honestly, the nicest thing about his videos, like you do learn a lot, is that he's so humble. And he's like, I don't know what I'm doing with TensorFlow.js, but let's try this. And he shows himself like learning and failing as it goes. So that kind of helps boost my confidence to um, keep going on this project. So. Uh, yeah, so I uh, was learning about TensorFlow 8.js, and I could have made things a lot easier for me since I'm going to be using hardware by not using TensorFlow.js and not using JavaScript and doing this all in Python. But uh, like, if you were here earlier for Tara's talk, like, if you can do it in JavaScript, it'll probably be done in JavaScript. And I'm a JavaScript engineer, so uh, and this uh, no one had really done like. TensorFlow.js on hardware on a Pi yet, so I kind of wanted to be one of the first. Um, so I want to do all the machine learning in JavaScript. And if you're not a, a familiar with TensorFlow.js, it's just a library for training and running machine learning models, in the, and it's mainly geared at the browser, um, not the back end. So since it was geared more towards the browser, there's really two things that I wasn't sure of from the beginning and this, that I started with because I had to, they were the unknowns that I had to figure out to finish my project, is I needed to get the a machine learning model running in Node and, and instead of in the browser. And two, I wasn't even sure if, sure if I could run TensorFlow.js in Node on a Pi yet. So I started with this machine learning model, Tiny YOLO. It stands for you only look once. And I chose this one because it's one of the fastest for in-browser image detection on like kind of like mid-level equipment. It can do it in like 800 milliseconds, which is pretty fast. It just has a really, it doesn't have like a full image library as like the YOLO model. So it's just, but it had people and that's, I was only really concerned with people. So, um, this is what I decided to use, and it was already trained, so I wouldn't have to do any of that. 
Um, so I needed to convert this to uh, work not in a browser, in Node. And to do this, it was just a lot of minor code changes, um, like things if, if you were just converting something to run to Node anyway. So um, I had to use a different TensorFlow.js um, package. They have one built for Node. Uh, I had to store the models locally instead of on the web. I had to modify like import export statements to like require statements. Um, and I couldn't, uh, in this uh, model, they were using the webcam, um, like APIs, this media devices, get user media API. I can't use that since that's browser based, so I had to convert it to use image, load image files and use that instead of just using like a webcam API. Um, yeah. And I'm not gonna show like a lot of code snippets during this talk because it's so specific to this project, but I have links to like all my, the, there will be some code, but the, there are like links to all my GitHub repos and stuff if you wanna check it out. Um, so I got the model running in Node. So the next I needed to get TensorFlow.js working on Raspberry Pi. And when I started this project, um, Back in the end of January, I got really lucky that the TensorFlow.js team had just started working on this like a few days before. Um, so they had made a change. Uh, it wasn't merged into um, the release yet, um, but they had the code in place. Basically, they, you had to check for like the operating system and if they would support um, using the, the architecture that the Pi uses. Um, so I had to, since it was there but it wasn't in the build, I had to like figure out how to get it running locally in my Pi, so I just had to build it using like a Yalc library to build it. But I got it um, working. I was pretty proud of that because I had never tried to do that before. And um, there's, I have a disclaimer that I'm using like an older, ver a pretty like eight months old version of TensorFlow.js. Like, so the current release is 1.2.8, and they're also pre prepping release candidate 2.0 right now. But I don't care. Um, I did this months ago, and honestly, I don't want to touch it and mess it up. That's one reason. <laughs> and uh, I, yeah, if it works, like, I, I mean, this is just my own personal project. Like, I don't feel pressure to, like, upgrade things. Like, if it works and it's just sitting on me and not on the web, then... There's no real vulnerabilities, like it just runs. So um, just a disclaimer, if you wanna try to get this running yourself, there will be some differences um, from my code. Um, yeah, so this is like a picture I took that you could actually see, one of the first pictures I took. So, um, and it actually recognized that I had a dog and me, and the, it was probably a dog and probably me, a person in the picture. And, yeah, this was just like really exciting to me. It was probably one of the first projects running TensorFlow.js and a model on a Pi. Um, yeah. So the next thing, I, since I had those two big things that I was worried about accomplished, the next I needed to create this necklace. And I, as a maker, I see shiny new hardware and stuff all the time, and I buy stuff all the time. It's a curse. Um, but I had these things called blinky tiles. It's this kit for people can like learn how to solder. You can make these like octahedral balls and it comes with just a microcontroller with it that's preset with programs. Um, so I wanted to use that. And I actually had tried to make a wearable with it before just using their uh, controller that comes with it. And I made this wearable, but when I moved to Berlin for my job, it got completely destroyed. So I kind of wanted just to like harvest all these um, parts since I thought when I made something before it was quite beautiful and just reuse this. But I wanted to use my own microcontroller so then I could actually hook it up with a Pi and control everything. Um, and luckily, like, there is a library for controlling blinky tiles with an Adreno. Um, I guess, like, one take home of this talk is, like, I'm really glad that, 
like you can find libraries and use them and you should try to do that and just you can you don't always have to reinvent the wheel you can like build off of the work of others and do it do things that they weren't even expecting you to do with their libraries um, so yeah there was a, so I knew that they, it could be controlled with another Adreno um, so I just uh, to just I before I completely built my wearable I just tested it and I was able to use a Teensy uh, 3.2 um, Adreno board and plug it in and uh, I could actually control it to flash the lights back and forth. So then I started laying out and trying to design the wearable. And I, yeah, I thought I wanted to do something like over, over the shoulder, but then I decided more on like a statement necklace type design. And um, it, as you can see on the photo on the right, this is how it ended up. And I would solder everything. I have a mannequin, and I soldered everything like this, just on the mannequin, just meticulously cutting wires and soldering um, directly on my mannequin to make sure I have like the best like fit. Um, so yeah, I created, I wired and soldered that. Then I needed to figure out actually how to get data from the Pi to the Adreno and the lights of the wearable. So I needed to find a way to have communication between the Raspberry Pi and the Adreno. And for this, I wanted to use, I didn't want to rely on anything like wireless based, like no Bluetooth, uh, no Wi-Fi. I wanted to, do, oh no. Um, okay. <laughs> Maybe it like sensed enough people. I don't know. This is like very scary to do with a wearable. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I wanted to just ha kind of just hardwire everything. Um, so it would be more robust for me that I would not possibly, it, would it could fail from wiring, but it wouldn't fail from dropping a signal somewhere. Um, so I decided to use serial ports. And on the Pi, they have one for, they have a pin that's receiving and one for uh, sending. So I could just, and on the Adreno, they have the same thing. So I could just like hardwire, like a wire basically between them just to send from one to the other. And I really struggled with this. Like there's a lot of documentation for the Raspberry Pi 3B on setting up um, serial communication. But there was like a lot of caveats to this and I really got stumped for a couple weeks trying to figure this out because I wanted to do this thing called a loop back just to see if on the Raspberry Pi it was working. It's just where you connect from the sending to the receiving and it just sends a message back and forth to itself. And I, I couldn't get it working and I send out de desperate tre tweets on the internet trying to find, get some help. Um, but uh, I, I did eventually get it working, and I was very happy to see this. This is like the loopback console. I could see that it was sending something back and forth. And um, this is like all the config I had to set up to just to get the serial working on the Raspberry Pi 3. I found some like really obscure blog posts. There was just a lot of things that like on boot I needed to like disable and uh, yeah set up. So. Um, I just wasn't expecting that to be difficult, but um, sometimes like simple things are difficult, I guess. Um, at this point, I had built my wearable and I had my Pi and I wanted to hook them up together, but I was having some serious issues on both. Um, so the first one, as you can see, um, I was having some power issues on the Raspberry Pi. It is not supposed to be strobe blitz like, seizure inducing <laughs> flashing um, and this felt like a built I knew it was some kind of power issues and I know like the the blinky tiles they run on five volts and the teensy was like 3.3 volts but it was five volt tolerant it's just it's a little bit like I love hardware but it's still kind of like a black box a bit to me I'm just discovering things as I go um, so it was a little bit out of my abilities at the time to really spend a lot of time debugging this so I just um, switched boards and <laughs> I like I said I buy a lot of stuff for making so I had these this mini metro lying around for another project that I never made I used a different board for it and I switched 
switched it, um, and I got really lucky that because uh, I was suspecting it was this like five volts, three volts issues, and the Mini Metro has a five volt output, so that matched the blinky tiles better, and it actually solved my problem. And luckily, like I didn't even realize it at the time, but the the, the library I was using for the Adreno blinky lights communication, um, like this is one of the few boards that. Um, what, what the architecture will work for this. So I just kind of learned things like after the fact by um, just by luck. And that's like a happy instance because that doesn't happen a lot. Um, the other big problem was my Raspberry Pi was crashing. It was, it had a huge memory leak. And it, after about an hour running, um, it was full. Um, and the swap memory was getting full, and I, I was just monitoring on HTOP like remotely to see this. And I was trying to debug this, and all I saw, saw that was that a node app was running. And um, I looked through my code like multiple. I had no idea; like it didn't seem like there was like any memory leak in my code. And then um, the reason was. If you remember this project, speech to image uh, necklace project, I was using the same Pi and the same SD card. And this was actually uh, still booting up on startup. Because I was using like PM2 to like boot it up at startup and run node. And um, turns out that that project has a memory leak. And so that's why it was really hard to debug because I just saw there was like this node app called app.js running and that's like what I named both of them. And um, yeah, uh, so yeah, it turned out that this was still running and it had a memory leak, but I fixed it and this does not have a memory leak. Um, I'm really limited just by the size of battery that I use with this to run this now. Um, so after fixing those bugs, I could get back on track to uh, what I originally was like in the process of doing, which was sending data from the Pi to the lights. And so I had to ask myself a question. How do I, I I'm going to use serial port, but how do I want to send the data? And being a front end JavaScript um, developer, I said, I use JSON everywhere else. I'll use JSON here. <laughs> And it turns out JSON on Adreno is a thing. There's a, there's a library, and I got it working. This is the code um, from, this is a code on the Pi, oh, yeah, sorry, on the Adreno. Um, so I can just use this library, and this is running, if you're not familiar with like Adreno, it has like a, two main programs running. There's a setup that start, when it starts, and then there's a loop, and you basically put anything you want to be called in the loop, and it's just constantly running over and over. So whenever we get a message, or we create this uh, uh, JavaScript um, um, structure, and then uh, it could parse out and get the data from it. And it worked, but it, was, it turned out to be a really bad decision. And it turned out to be a really bad decision um, because um, whenever this loop was running, when it actually received data, uh, the light would pause to process it. Adreno is like single threaded and it has very, I mean, it's like tiny. It has very limited resources. So this was just like too like memory intensive for really just getting a, a number from the Pi um, to process it. So I, uh, took a step back and thought about like not what I know, but what is actually good for hardware, not my web knowledge of JSON. And I switched to using just bytes. And I could just use three bytes. So this is code from the Node app, just a snippet of what I changed. So I just changed it so I just create a buffer with three bytes. And then uh, I have like uh, one byte at the beginning and one at the end, just so the Adreno will look for those and all the signals that it gets over serial, and then know when it's getting a message, and then it just gets the, I just send the number, because I just need one byte, because it's gonna, all that the tiny YOLO can handle at a time is like 20 um, objects to recognize, so it would never be over like a byte size when it's only, can be up to 20. So I switched to that. Um, 
And then, yeah, for like the rest of my work, it was really just working in like C++ Adreno code to um, build the lights. And yeah, I just wrote a bunch of C programs. Um, and I'm not gonna show you the light programs, but I'll show you just kind of, so you can understand kind of what's happening on the necklace is, and basically once it gets the message of how many people there are, it can uh, switch program, set, it sets a program based on, on that. And what I have going on is it's like a lot more chaotic and energetic at the beginning. And then it, as it gets up to, I think, um, six people is when it'll finally shut down because Tiny Yellow can do up to 20 um, image recognized. But the thought of 20 people around me for it to turn off was terrifying. So I did what I was comfortable with, and I thought like six people is like a good amount of people to have around me. So it gets a message, gets the people count, and updates the program. Um, and you can see all the C codes on this link um, if you want to check that out. And um, I had all been testing this on my mannequin and not on me. So when I finally put it on me, there was problems. So I was having some bad connections and it was shorting and the fit. I originally uh, thought I would just wear like a fanny pack and put everything in, but uh, everything is like way too big for that. Um, so this is uh, why I decided to move to like this waist center and sewing things on and it's just like a lot better fit. And if you're doing a wear project, like always wear, <laughs> try on your stuff like way before and don't do what I did. Um, and then there's like one bonus feature I added in because sometimes, frankly, I've just had enough and I can't handle any more of like this at the moment and I need a break. So I wanted to add in a way to turn off the lights completely. Um, so what I did is I have here, I have a ring that I made with a button and I can long press it and turn it off and I can long press it to turn back on. Um, but the other thing is maybe I, if I want to switch the programs completely, meaning that when no one's around it's calm and then as more people around it's really energetic, I also put in that I can do a short press. And um, yeah, it, it'll like basically flip like the program of what's going on. Let me turn it back. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sometimes I get confused even like what program I'm on myself. Um, yeah, so I, that's the last thing I did and I added it in and you can kind of see these are like the, the programs I wrote in C for these button presses and yeah, um, this was a really hard build and I got demotivated a lot. It took eight months versus three months and that's because I took some like month long breaks between some of these problems that I was having like um, with like power issues and things like it just, I didn't work on it continuously. And I always could have done stuff differently but this is what worked for me. Um, and I hope it's inspired you or in, um, piqued your curiosity about wearables and machine learning. And I just want to say thank you. And that I love talking about non-tech things. Like I, I love talking about tech things, but I also love talking about non-tech things. So I put some conversation starters. So if you like fashion or nail art or dogs or Bojack, um, you feel free to come and talk to me about any of these things or we can talk about tech too. I'm not doing a Q&A because I just don't do Q&As because I'm very sensitive after like the end of a talk. I did bring stickers if you want any queer JS or I have this like little dog character I made, little pink dog on a computer. I don't know, I have stickers up here. You can find me, I'll be here both days. So say hi, let's chat. And that's it, thank you.